talking about crosses. What do you think of when you hear the word the cross? Yell out some answers. Say again. Pain. Pain? Okay, what else? Crucifixion. Crucifixion? Yeah. What are some other things when you think of the cross? What do you what words come to mind? Sacrifice? Salvation. Salvation. Victory. Victory. Family. Family. Great answers. We often, um, when we see the cross or hear about the cross, we, we usually think of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, right? Take a look at this verse. Then Jesus, sorry, then calling, to, calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you want to be my follower, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. I've heard this many preach uh, on this verse. And as a kid, I went to camp and church and would hear this over and over again. And to be honest with you, it was not one of my favorite verses. I mean, let's backtrack a little. We have verses like Psalm 20, verse 4. May he give you the desires of your heart and make all your plans succeed. I think that's a great verse, eh? I like that one. How about Matthew 7, verse 7? For anyone who seeks, receives. The one who, who seeks, sorry. For everyone who asks, receives. For the one that seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Just beautiful. Matthew 21, 22. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Perfect. And my favorite one, John 15, verse 7. If you remain in me and I in you, whatever you ask for, whatever you wish, it will be done for you. These are the verses that we Christians love to preach on, right? They're uplifting, they're promising, they're just fantastic for introducing Jesus to someone else. And then bam, as soon as you become a Christian and you make that decision to follow Christ, we're here with this verse. If any of you want to be my follower, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Wow, I wasn't expecting that one. I mean... God, you said, for God so loved the world that you gave your only one and only son, that whoever believes in me will not die but have eternal life. And now you're asking me to die and deny myself and bear my cross? I don't know about you, but I find that a little depressing. See, many people think, and I've heard it being preached on, that this means that we have to give up our lives and accept the fact that life is going to be a little hard and that's the price that we pay for being Christians. It might be involved sickness, it might be hardships, and bad things are going to happen. I mean, you see some Christians walking around, some of them walk around so miserably. No joy in their lives at all. They have sadly misunderstood what this verse means. When Jesus took up his cross, it was the cross of atonement. I'm going to, going to get you to hold that thought right there, and I want to introduce you to a young fellow who is part of LifePoint. One of the things I love doing here is getting to know you in the congregation <coughs> and hearing your story about where you're at on your journey. And today, my friend Abby is going to share with you his experience on what carrying his cross means to him through his studies and the art of the <coughs> Ethiopian cross. The Ethiopian cross, as you may know, is so intricate and, and beautiful. Many actually wear it on the inside of their right arm as a symbol of their Christian faith. So over to you, Abby, and then I'll come back and uh, I'll wrap things up. Welcome, Abby. artist and I'm proud to be a member of the family here at LifePoint Community Church. Today I'll be sharing with you uh, one of my first projects titled Carry the Cross. And this is a drawing of uh, Ethiopian Orthodox cross and yeah here it is. I've also <coughs> Alright so every drawing has a journey, it has a process from its initial inception in my brain till when it's finally created there's a journey that you go on. It's kind of interesting. You would just think a drawing is just a drawing, but while you're sitting there, I mean, this took about one to two months, so there's a process that it takes you along. And I want to get you into the frame of mind that I was in when I started this project. So it all began when uh, I went to school in 
and basically most art students, they know they want to be an artist, and I didn't know that. I kind of went into school with all these ideas of the world, and I kind of wanted to express them, and I felt I would do that with art. So uh, once I had left school, many artists had this issue, like, what am I going to show the world? What am I going to draw about? And that wasn't my issue. I had already had all these ideas. So once I came out of school, I was still fearful of these large ideas. So I thought, let me start small. Let me start with something that's easily digestible, easily transferable and understandable by people. And something also visually pleasing. And I thought of, oh, the Ethiopian cross, what a great idea. Um, I thought I could share this um, beautiful Ethiopian art and also kind of express uh, Ethiopian excellence to the world. And, and so I could be proud of myself and proud of my heritage, but also express something and share something with the viewers. So I created this, this image. So also, I was a little bit uh, scared that I wouldn't be engaged. So I chose this specific cross, because there's many crosses that uh, kind of, they represent different villages and different regions, and they're specific to every church. So I found this one, and I really loved it. So I was able to sit there for a month or two and stay focused, because you need a lot of focus to do the drawing like this. So once I started the drawing process, I found constantly just doors opening of information, whether it was through friendly conversations with people who know the history of Ethiopia, or um, materials like images and books. And I ended up finding a video that highlighted the significance of the cross in Ethiopian culture and also kind of highlighted the craftsmanship and the process of cross making. I'm going to share that with you now. Enjoy. By the lost wax process, a hand cross is to be made, a square sheet of beeswax is designed with one of the traditional cross patterns. This is the center square of what will be a diamond-shaped hand cross. This method of casting metal was used by the Egyptians four and a half thousand years ago. In Ethiopia, the technique has been handed down from generation to generation. Other bits are joined to the center square. These are called the finials. separately. Soft clay is prepared by one of the girls. It is mixed with shredded sacking. The wax model is now covered with clay. spaces are carefully filled in. Curious to think that in Ethiopia all kinds of craftsmanship were considered low-class activities in the past. People who worked with their hands were looked down on, so the originality and achievements of the cross makers is all the more remarkable. model is completely encased with clay. A hole is left in the bottom to allow the wax to escape. After being left to dry in the sun, the clay-covered wax cross is placed in the forge. The clay is baked hard. Bellows made of sheepskin are used.
The wax cross which was inside the clay melts away through the channel left for this purpose. The cross maker has to be sure that all the wax has melted away. Scraps of metal are put into the crucible. Used shell cases are a common ingredient. They are in plentiful supply since the military came to power. The shell cases are mixed with pieces of zinc and other base metals like tin. The alloy varies. The crucible is placed in the forge. It takes a lot of hard work before the melting point of the metals is reached. This boy worked non-stop for two hours before the metal melted. A piece of zinc is added at the end. The crucible is taken out of the forge. The molten metal is poured in through the channel in the clay moulds. A number have already been prepared. The metal runs into all the little spaces where the wax models were. The brass cross is revealed with its rough edges and other imperfections. The cross is filed smooth. The quality of the finished cross depends on the care taken in filing and in decorating it. Few of these crosses are intended for use in churches. Most of them are bound for the market although special orders will be placed from time to time when the villagers club together to present a local priest with a new cross. One member of the family files crosses while another decorates them. Lines are incised and little circles are stamped on the surface. In the olden days, more elaborate decoration was attempted, but present-day craftsmen work faster and are less ambitious. When the handle has been fixed on, the cross is ready to be consecrated in church or to be bargained over in the market. Dealers do good business in Lalibela market. In this part of the country, everyone wears a neck cross or has a pattern tattooed on the forehead. For a long period, the Christian Highlanders fought with the people of the book cross making and significance in Ethiopia. There was one book that my mother gave me that kind of caught my attention with more conviction. It's kind of funny because they say mothers know best. It's kind of true in this case. Um, this book was called uh, The Cross of Christ by John R. W. Stott. And this book did two things for me. It kind of showed me my lack of understanding of the crucifixion and the Bible in general. And it also gave me new perspective. Prior to this book, I believed that the crucifixion of Christ was a one-sided story. The work was done, and we could all just say hallelujah and go to bed. But that, that wasn't the truth. There was a call involved. We had a responsibility as well. I mean, if you can see, like, like she showed that uh, the verse earlier, Jesus calls to us to carry the cross as well. And I thought about this a lot, and I, and I, I started realizing that there was three verses that were almost exactly the same that repeat this message, a call to us. And I can show you here. The first
first is the first is Matthew sixteen twenty four. It says, "Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me." And then again in Luke nine twenty three. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. And almost, again, exactly, word for word. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my, my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. It almost seems weird, like almost like plagiarizing each other, like three verses in a row, exactly the same thing. And it reminded me of like when parents try to drill something into you, like saying, do this, do this. You're like, oh, I've heard you millions of times. But your parents are only saying it because you haven't done anything. And I feel like Jesus is saying the same thing. Like, take up your cross and follow me. And we're not following him. And I feel like that's the reason why it was repeated. So I thought about this. And I don't want to look at the Bible as a book of suggestions. I want to make it like, how can it relate to our lives now? What are we doing? What am I doing? And I thought, can we do this? Can we live our lives for Jesus? So the more I thought about this, four individuals came to my mind and who kind of exemplified this, taking this call on and taking this responsibility. And that's when my drawing kind of went further than just the drawing. It became a larger project. So these four individuals, uh, there was one, his name was Jordanos, which translates to Jordan. And uh, show this picture, sorry, this picture here. And he's a father and uh, a bus driver in the city. He works for TTC. And, um, by our standards of life, like maybe he's not living the successful life that we deem successful in our in standards day of society. Like he's not maybe financially doing amazing, or he hasn't has some huge aspirations. But he understands the one thing that he takes dear to his heart is his relationship with God. And I found that to be answering his call, understanding what it means to follow Christ. And uh, there was one case in particular when he said to me, "Abby, you might have large goals, but if you don't have God, that means nothing." And kind of struck me and said, like, this guy understands his call. And there was a second individual. Her name's Danny, and she's an aspiring musician. She moved to the city and ended up signing with a label, a hip-hop label, um, Cash Money, which is not known for Christian music at all. But she, a lot of people were kind of ridiculing her, and they were weary of her decisions, but she understood that it, God had no boundaries, and that maybe her calling was... Well, well, what she told me specifically was she wanted to put God's messages in and mainstream music, so she could touch everyone everywhere. So she was another person to understand that calling. So I kind of wanted to highlight her, so we did a photo with her as well, her playing, making music um, in her room, and I was there as well, so that was kind of nice. She's a great singer. And the third was Alex. He's a professional basketball player, and he's aspiring to get to the NBA, and he's always been struggling to do that, but he understood that God's call for him was more important than his own goals, and he, was, he submitted to that. And he was able to minister in China to kids while playing basketball. So he understood his, his journey as well and what God wanted for him was important. So that's him in the change room after he came. And, and the last one was Johnny, uh, an individual who uh, had trouble in run-ins with the law and spent some time away in jail, but ended up finding God. And now uh, he went to Bible college and he's trying to become a minister. And he, he has access to circles that many people don't have access to God and don't hear the word, but he was able to minister to them. And they, they take it a little bit more serious because they know he knows both sides of humanity. And, uh, <laughs> and the last picture, I just did a collage with all of them in a, in a picture just with the cross that I drew. And, and they're all happy to be a part of this project. And, uh, yeah, that's the picture there. And uh, thinking of all these four individuals and thinking of our responsibility and our call, kind of doesn't get rid of that difficulty. Like, I understand how it feels because, I mean, I thought of other people. I didn't think of myself, obviously. And, and even though that difficulty is there, whether it's in the name of um, fear, guilt, or, um, or greed, that's the same fear that caused the crucifixion of Jesus. And uh, we can get over that, um, that fear. And I feel like we just have to understand that if God is with us, we can overcome these difficulties and answer our call to carry our cross. Thank you. I saw this on the internet this week as we're preparing for this Sunday. Can you wear one? You can wear one, but can you bear one? Which I thought was very interesting given the topic for today. What I loved about those uh, four stories that Abby shared with us is that God used their passion for their calling. I think sometimes 
we think we have to go looking for our calling. But how beautiful is it that God uses our passion, our gifts, our desires, our stories to make his story. Carrying the cross is simply coming under the submission of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is doing what he has called us to do and follow him. We read in Philippians 2, 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Galatians 2, Galatians 2, 30 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live in faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So when we read that verse in the Gospels that says to deny ourselves, take, take up our cross, we can know that this is Jesus saying, surrender your ways to me. I have come that you may have life and life to the fullest. This is not a bad thing. But instead, it's a verse that gives us hope. It gives us peace. And it gives us a purpose in our lives. Remember the words that you yelled out at the beginning of the service? Forgiveness, redemption, love, grace, all those words. Have you ever thought that maybe God is calling you to carry those words as your cross? Here's a list of words that Lisa Bevere made a few years ago. I've heard Lisa speak many, many times. How about carrying this cross? There's a lot of hurting people out there. Do you see how some of these words could be a benefit to someone else? What cross are you called to carry? Let me leave you with a paraphrased, paraphrased version of Mark, 34, Mark 8, 34. If anyone wants to follow me, if he wants to walk in my steps and lead a life that says to others, I am learning how to live life by observing the life of Jesus Christ. Then let him say, say no to self-interest, no to self-agendas, and even no to self-preservation in human understanding, and say yes. Say yes to God. That is the part about carrying your cross. And whatever, whatever he asks, no matter how unreasonable it may seem, I gladly, I gladly follow you. Not my will, but yours be done. Father, we thank you for your cross. We thank you that what this means to us, and it means different things to us. And the cross of atonement that you bore for us is nothing, it's nothing in comparison to what our crosses are. Father, this week as we go our separate ways, may we be under your submission, under your authority, and may we say yes to you. May our selfish ways be put into the past and not dictate our future. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Have a good day.